Welcome back, everyone, to Vox Markets. My name is Paul Hill, and I'm delighted again to be able to speak to Ken Watton of Gresham House, one of the UK's finest small and mid-cap investors. So welcome, Ken. Hi, Paul. Thanks very much. Yeah, well, we've got quite a bit of a few cross-currents, actually, in the um, markets at the moment. We've obviously got the ongoing war in Ukraine, the tightening central banks, and the cost of living crisis. But on the other hand, actually, we've had some encouraging news in terms of lower inflation, obviously the uh, China reopening and stock prices, valuations have reset considerably from last year. So putting all that into the mix, what's your sort of outlook for um, for equities going forward? I'm sort of sadly going to say something similar to what I've sort of been saying for quite some time, which is, you know, whilst you know, there's lots of uncertainty, some cause for optimism, you know, my kind of default position is that we're going to see sort of periods of uh, of sentiment-driven volatility in, in markets for, for you know at least through so through the first half, if probably not if, if not the whole of, of this year. Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing, um, but I think there's just there's just too many sort of major uncertainties. Some of the ones that you've you've you've, you've flagged, which mm. you know, that from time to time is, are just going to spook people. Um, but you know, from my point of view, that whilst there's challenges around that, that also creates opportunities. So you know, it's not necessarily a bad thing for a stock picker. Yeah, but last year we had a lot of sort of like fund manager redemptions, particularly at the small cap area. I mean, my portfolio got totally washed out because of it, a lot of it. And is that sort of like still happening in terms of retail putting or taking money out of sort of like, you know, small and mid cap funds? Um, I mean, I've not seen the sort of the, the latest data for, for December, but you know, we, we kept seeing headlines through through last year, record outflows from UK equity funds and, and UK small cap funds. Um, so I think it's been pretty painful overall. Um, from, we, we were in a very fortunate position that we had net inflows into our funds last year, um, uh, which uh, mainly into our multi-cap income fund, but, but uh, you know, we didn't lose material money from the other funds um, as some, some of the, the peer group did. Uh, and you know, so thankfully that was you know, when other people are sort of having to sell because of, of, of cash calls, we weren't in that position, so that, that's yeah. You know, so fingers crossed, we can we carry on with that. Yeah, well, I like that case. I'll have to look at uh, your portfolio in more detail and go along yeah. with those stocks. As in such but, that, uh, uh, what, what I would say on on, on the flows point, uh, I'm you know I, I, I'm, I'm optimistic that yeah. they'll they'll start to come back sort of at some point this year. Maybe not not in the first half, but um, you know the, the valuation discrepancy between the UK. Uh, and, and other developed markets, particularly the US, uh, the, the, the valuation discount of UK small caps, the, the, the big disparity between UK uh, sort of small and mid cap listed equities and private market multiples sort of transactions, all of those point to, um, from, from my perspective to a really great valuation opportunity in, in the UK. Um, and, and I think we're going to see a big resurgence in takeover activity. It, it paused a bit post the mini budget last year, but I, I, I think... You know, that the gap between public and private multiples is so large at the moment in some of our stocks it, it's you know it's it's sort of 50 percent difference um i.e the private market multiples are double the 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 the, 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 you know, the the public multiples that you that that's just too big to not be exploited by either corporate or private equity buyers uh, and once you start to see a bit of that and we, we obviously have had quite a bit of that over the last two or three years once you start to see that i think that will just shine a light on the valuation discrepancy and I hope that means that people will start to allocate back to the UK and that will be benefit, benefiting to, to small cap funds like ours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I mean, you've certainly seen, uh, well, actually quite a pickup just before. I mean, one of my portfolio stocks, Crestchick, got taken out by yeah. uh, Agrico. And I think there's uh, Seraphine, the, uh, the maternity dress uh, company, also got sort of bought out for a 200% premium this morning. So uh, I, th I think you're absolutely right. Now, just on that, that trend, if you're sort of like looking for sort of stocks, which are obviously undervalued, but also have that potential optionality in terms of M and A. What would you look for? Is, I mean, is it, is it, is it balance sheet, USPs? I mean, what what yeah. kind of things do you look for? And we, yeah. So so just to be clear, we we we're not investing in companies because we think that mm. take out coming on a sort of six month view. Um, but we've always, you know, for years now, tried to find companies that you know they're not overly cyclical. Um, and, and the fundamentals are strong, and obviously that the, the fundamentals being strong depends on the sector and, and, and situation. But uh, you know, it, I, I guess in summary, it's a company with 
an attractive market opportunity, ideally with structural sort of tailwinds in terms of growth. So you know, even if the UK economy is, is not growing and we're in a recession, they could still grow. Um, you know, having a clear strategy to create value, having some sort of competitive advantage or, or differentiation to business model, um, which makes them stand out versus competitors. You know, really importantly, having a strong management team who can execute on the strategy. Um, and, and then you know, good quality fundamentals. Typically, we're looking for companies that you know, are profitable, cash, cash generating, have higher than average margins and, and uh, you know, limited or, 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 or even no financial leverage, which means they can be resilient in this kind of environment. So all of those characteristics, which we like, well, you know, guess what? Those are also the, some of the characteristics which private equity like. And you know, if, you're, if you're good at spotting companies that either have strategic value, which is not being recognised by the market, or are in a position and are trying to build strategic value over, over the next few years, those are the kind of companies we, we really like. And if they're, they're happily trading at a big discount to sort of similar businesses in private markets, then that's what creates the opportunity from a takeover point of view. So look, we, we don't want all of our companies to be taken over. Um, but no, not, not unless it's... I wouldn't uh, mind it. <laughs> but not, but not, not, a, not, not a, a sort of, you know, 25, 30% premium today. That's, that, you know, yeah. that, that's fine for short, for people who are sort of short term. Uh, but, you know, we're looking for businesses with three to five year opportunities. And I, you know, if, if I think I can double or triple my money over five years, I don't want to sell it at 25% premium today. If I get, if I get tomorrow's price today, then, then, then great. But, but, you know, that's, that's not always what happens. Yeah, no, you're right. Well, just on that tune then, we've got, I mean, one which sort of fits, seems to fit the bill is, um, which is swimming against the tide, actually, is, is mm-hmm. Team 17. It's in sort of yeah. indie gaming. It's a developer. Yeah. It's got a massive lot of cash. You've got over 50 million pounds of, uh, of, of cash. It's still growing, I think. And we've had some sort of like, you know, profit warnings in terms of frontier developments. And I think Devolvo as well, also yeah. in a small area. But these guys seem to be hitting their numbers and um, meeting their um, meeting their targets. So th- th- this, it's obviously got something about them. Yeah, look, I think it, it's it's. I, I think this is the highest quality business in that sector, is only in, in in small cap in the UK. Mm. Um, and it's a sector which obviously benefited hugely from from COVID and people being at home and and sort of <laughs> that that the gaming being a sort of uh, a, a default leisure activity because they had, there, were, there were no other options um, and I think you know so so a lot of the companies got got put on to huge ratings assuming that 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 growth would continue to, for, for you know indefinitely and 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 that hasn't proved to be the case and team 17 along with, with all the others got derated hugely last year when with sort of sh- shift from 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 growth to more value focused sort of stocks um but we've also thought that the business model of Team Seventeen, which is you know, it's about cultivating third-party IP and 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 uh, you know, being more diversified, was a better business model because the quality of earnings are higher. And we rate the management team very highly. We we originally invested in the IPO actually, but then you know, probably a couple of years after we 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 sold because of the rating we felt it was just just had gone gone a bit too far. Um, and we bought back sort of you know, Q4 last year. Um, because of the D rating, and you know, big focus of, of our, our sort of diligence when we when we're trying to look at it again was, you know, do we really believe they can make the numbers this year for 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 twenty twenty two? Because you know, it, it, there was a big question mark about that. I think that's one of the reasons why why it was D rated, and we did a lot of work trying to sort of unpick what needed to be true for them to make the numbers, and we convinced ourselves that they would be able to. Um, and you know, it looks like they they're the only one in the sector that actually yeah, has good call. To do that. So you know it's, it's it's done well since we bought it, but you know we didn't just buy it for the short term earnings. We we you know we think this is a, a great long term prospect. Mm. Another one which is sort of like real the highest quality in its area is um, is Fintel, and mm-hmm. um, I mean this one is, again. I think there's a big sort of difference between the private market valuations and the public market valuations. Again, it's yeah. it's sort of growing, got high ARR and um, you know recurring revenue streams, mm-hmm. good margins and. Again, they seem to have delivered. What, what's your sort of latest on um, on Fintel? Yeah, no, I think it, it, it's, it's a good company. Um, we, we first invested in in uh, sort of twenty twenty, sort of, uh, you know, on the on the back of the, the COVID sort of market sell off, and we felt um, it was a business that was transitioning from being you know, it was called it used to be called Simply Beers. It, mm. it was a company that originated by providing 
sort of com- outsource compliance and tech services to to long tail IFAs, so this is the sm- small IFAs to who could sort of plug into their buying power and the, and, and their sort of economies of scale. Um, and it's evolved over that time um, with the key change being the, the acquisition of de facto, which is sort of data research and, and ratings provider. Um, and you know, our thesis is you know, the fir- first of all, the market was kind of worried about the debt that it had, but we felt the cash generation was, was, was underlying was strong and they could pay the debt down, which they've done now. Um, but the key thing is this is a business which is now, or it's trying to evolve itself from service provider to IFAs mm-hmm to tech platform that can provide tech and data services, both the IFAs, but also the fund uh, sort of pr- producers, so the manufacturers of the financial yeah. products. Um, and, and if they do that, this should be on a premium rating. Um, mm-hmm. So that, that's the thesis. It, it can grow attractively. It, it's getting better quality of earnings. The platform status means they've got a really sticky sort of customer base and barriers to entry. And you know, they, they haven't proven it completely yet, but I think, but if they do, I think this can be a really, really valuable company. It's, an, it's a consolidating sector, I think. Was it Euro Money last year got taken out quite a big number, I think, so like 20 times EBITDA or something. I was just yeah, looking no, at what... these, 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 these businesses can be really valuable if they, if they sort of carve out a position in, in their niche. Yeah. Well, I was looking at Fintel. I mean, it's on, what, 210p, I think, something around about a number of 10 times EBITDA. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that, mean, that, does, that does highlight what the difference is in uh, yeah, private exactly. and uh, public market valuations. Quite agree. Um, what about um, Argentex, which, again, is sort of like it's got lots and lots of cash. It uh, is a sort of specialist uh, foreign exchange um, <clears throat> dealer and trader, but putting on a, it's, it's an IT platform to do sort of yeah. like straight through processes plus expand abroad and i think the uh that really is taking it seems to be taking shape and it's still on i mean i'll highlight to investors i can't believe it's still on it's on 12 times per and if you strip out the cash it's probably on about 11 yeah yeah no, so we've been in the shelter in it since since ipo um and it's a sector we like so so so, so that, yeah there are different types of businesses in in that sort of fx uh, area mm. some of which are that's quite transactional and low quality, and others others are, are, are much more kind of long term service providers. And this is in that last category. And we we first actually looked at the sector you know, back when I worked at, at Living Bridge uh, a few years ago, where um, when, when we engaged with Alpha FX, which is a sort of yes. another, another business in that space. Um, we, we engaged with them pre IPO, and then we sort of backed the IPO. That did, did brilliantly. It's been a, a real success story in the market. Um, and when we exited that, we were looking for another opportunity and our Gentex were highlighted as another sort of high quality player in that sector. So we, we were really keen to position ourselves to cornerstone the IPO, uh, which we did. And then you know, over, over the period since IPO, there's been some headwinds, clearly Brexit caused lots of, uh, um, kind of volatility in the currency markets, which has good and bad sort of implications mm. for them. And then COVID was also another another period. And what, you know, their clients, which are, Typically, corporates with with sort of genuine FX exposure yeah. in their business to be hedged. Um, that you know, during COVID, c- customers weren't doing anything, so they they, they sort of suffer from that, and they, they, they miss their numbers and the shares derated. But you know that that whole segment of the market is you know these independent sort of corporate currency uh, uh, providers, the service providers, they're taking market share from the the, the high street banks um, because they get better service and they charge less. So. You know, it, it's an area where we think there's good structural growth. It's a good quality company. It's got a good name in the market. And as you say, it's, it's it looks really cheap. If you compare the rating for, of, of Argentix to Alpha FX, mm. you know, it's, it's, it's on a you know, less than half the rating. So you know, for, for me, that, that that seems like a great opportunity. Yeah. What, what would you value it at? I mean, in terms of, it's all about, was it £1.20? I mean, have you got a, have you, could you disclose what you think it's worth or is it? Well, is that, I think, is that, is that yeah, confidential it, information? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm not going to give you my precise target price, but I do. I think if you if you benchmark it against Alpha, or if you benchmark it against, yeah. um, you know, there's another competitor, Global Reach, which was owned by yeah. a private equity firm that got sold quite recently. You know, the, the, the against yet another one where the rating is half or, or, or less okay. of, of equivalent sort of uh, company multiples, especially in, in transactions. So 
you can you can sort of read into that. It's, it's, so it starts with a two. Yeah. Okay. It? All right. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. It would be a bit of a stupid move to just to put a number right there, particularly if there was consolidation ever mm-hmm. on the market. Yeah, I agree. Um, now another one which came out with a trading update is Truefin, and again, this one seems to be a huge unbundling play in yeah. terms of it does sort of like you know fintech. It, um, sort of like um, early discount lending software, and it's got a really big contract with Lloyd's and a partnership with um, uh, Sage with its Otago. And I think its Oxygen division also received a big bid for £26 million. So it's got a a gaming business as well. Mm -hmm. Playstack, I think it is. And uh, the the, the market sort of responded quite sort of lackluster this morning, which was surprising given Mm -hmm. the sort of good news. How how do you view that, this business? Well, I think you know, it, it's it's a it's a sort of special situation which mm. it was a, a spin out of, of a few different fintech businesses from uh, from a hedge fund called Aragrass uh, a, a couple of years ago, and um, you know, the, the the play really is that when we bought and, and others did when when Aragrass were four sellers because they were they were winding up their fund, um, and you know the, the the four different businesses there. They, they sort of on, on on paper they kind of might not you might not think they fit well together but there was there was a, a sort of fintech or sort of uh, specialist lending element to each of them even mm. the gaming business has has a kind of uh, a, a sort of receivables uh, uh, lending component to it um, and look it just was really obvious to us that the the individual components if you added them together were worth much more than the share price was at the time and I still think that's the case today um, and, and you know, we've had a series of sort of really positive News flow from from the company since since we invested, and you, know, you, you mentioned the, the Lloyd's contract with with Citago, which is one of the subsidiaries. Mm. That 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 could be huge, and if they want another uh, uh, high street bank, so it's providing some uh, uh, some software and and, uh, and a platform for to enable lending to SMEs for for those banks, just in a more efficient way. Um, you know, if they got another high street bank, it's a game changer for that business. It could be hugely valuable. And mm-hmm. placed out the gaming business, which initially, when I first invested, I thought was the most exciting. And that's that's been doing okay, and I think it's got good potential. Um, and uh, as you say, Oxygen, which is the, the a business which is uh, um, enabling lending into into local government, um, you know, that had a bid for twenty six million, and you know, we together with the management team, together with other shareholders, felt that that undervalued the opportunity for that business, which is a you know, high recurring revenue business with with a with a kind of a long a long duration sort of contract base. So you don't really see the, the short term numbers don't don't show you the whole picture. So we we think the whole thing. I think Librem's got a share price target of of about 120p or something. Well, you know that yeah. that even that feels that's right. Yeah, 123. I think it is. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, I mean, it's certainly got a lot of lot, lot of upside. I think they get the unbundling, and it gets sort of a bit, a bit a bit clearer for people to uh, to, to sort of like, I, I guess, to invest in a bit more. Com- I don't know, but anyway, we'll see. Um, another one, larger one, uh, TP ICAP, which has done, which is basically into dealer broker, etc., yeah. and it still trades in a very low valuation, sort of less than seven times PER. Got a good dividend yield, mm-hmm. and um, it's obviously benefited a bit by. The sort of the trustonomics, the volatility yeah. in the interest rate market of late, mm. but even so, I mean that seems like for a large cap at one point four billion pounds, it seems like a bit of a no brainer at these levels for value investors. Yeah, no, it, it, it's, it's if you look at the sort of screen of general financials, it's, it's one of the cheapest companies out there. Um, you know, we, we bought it last year. Um, you know, again, it's another one with, where, where there's a, a sum of parts play to it because. Uh, you know, it, it the market hated the deal that it did to acquire LiquidNet, which you know, mm. required a big fundraising and and, and uh, quite a bit of leverage uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and you know, I think it got to the point where it got derated so much that you, you if you looked at it, you thought, well, this, this share price implies that the interdealer broker business is going bust effectively. It's not; it's going to zero. Um, LiquidNet is is not worth anything, and. They've got they've got this data business as well, which um, you know it, it was being was implied at pretty low rating. And if you if you actually sort of unpick what the, the implications of all that, I think you know, LiquidNet they, they may have overpaid for it, but you know it, it's it's a decent quality business that's not mm. going to do nothing. Um, it's worth something. You've got the interstate of broker business, which is one of the the, the market leaders. Um, and, you know, as you say, going into a period where there's more volatility and and, and therefore. 
kind of opportunity to drive earnings. And you know that it, it may be in an area which is sort of modestly declining, but it's not it's not falling off a cliff and disappearing anytime soon. So it will generate profits and cash for some time to come. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you've got this data business, which if you um, if you know, we were talking about it earlier on in the context of, of uh, euro money and and and, uh, and, and fintel. So, you know, th- those businesses are you know, very highly rated by private markets and, and when they're standalone. So, you know, I th- I th- again, I think the market's just overlooking it because it, it's underperformed historically. They didn't like that deal, and you know, probably people haven't looked at it properly for a while. Yeah, it does look far too cheap to me. <laughs> now, I know one of your um, areas of expertise is helping companies when they go through a sort of sticky patch. So I'm hoping you're going to sort of be ma- waving, yeah. your ma- waving your magic wand on, on tribal because this is, again, a high, potentially a very high quality business that does software into sort of like higher education, universities, yeah. et cetera. And it, it seems to have just temporarily slipped up with a large contract out in Singapore, mm-hmm. which yeah. is decimated its numbers i think but um how, how do you view this because it, it's the, the price has reset really str- you know strongly d- downwards and it's even on the reset financials it's still trading at a reasonable sort of 16 times pe and and, and frankly the, the financials should be a lot higher than that if they can get this contract sorted and done dusted yeah it, uh, it uh, we, we seems to be a theme here of, of un- undervalued <laughs> undervalued yes market leading companies but as i said tri- tribal it is the leader in in Providing sort of student administration software into, into higher education, um, you know, got blue chip universities and colleges around the world, um, and it's it, it, it's a very sticky sticky proposition. Um, so and, and actually, probably recurring can, revenue, I guess you mean? Yeah, re- higher recurring <laughs> revenue, and and, and you know, people, people, a lot of people might not realise this, but they also have in a lot of their contracts inflation linkage so they can increase their prices oh, right. year on year on year so there's natural kind of underlying growth there and inflation protection which is obviously pretty topical in this in this current environment um you know they the the, the valuation is you know, it's less than two times recurring revenue um, yeah 1.5 yeah yeah so you know the, oh. again it's sort of well, that's not going to sound like a broken record if you look at private market multiples for for decent quality software businesses yeah they, they, they've come down from Sort of stratospheric ten times revenue uh, from from a couple of years ago, but you know you're still a good quality uh, recurring revenue software business is 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 trading on four or five times uh, revenue, not not one and a half. And, you know, I remember going back ten years plus, you know, speaking to some software CEOs who were getting, well, you, know, you would buy just a a book of recurring um, support and maintenance book for three times revenue because um, mm. you could cut the cost out and make, and, and make money out of that. So for, for, for this business, which is operating and, and growing to be trading on half that, it just doesn't make sense to me. The the, the contracts in Singapore, yeah, you know, it, it, it's, it's gone temporarily bad. I hope they can sort it out. But even if you strip that out completely, it's clearly cost them money in the short term and they've had to make a provision against it, which has hit the numbers. Um, but... You know, even without that, this business is undervalued, it might be. Mm. And, and their balance sheet's okay. I mean, it looks fine at the moment in terms of less net debt less than one times EBITDA. Yeah, I think, yeah, and and, and, you know, and even if there's there's cash liabilities to pay on this contract, which I, you know, I've know i got, I'm optimistic that they, they won't end up being in the long run. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's still you know, underlying, it's generating profits mm. and cash, and you know, they're, they're, they're if it wasn't for this contract, they're coming to the end of a pretty major investment program where they've been sort of investing capex in in developing their sort of SaaS next generation products and some of the modules around that. And so, so our original thesis was that this this suddenly flips and gets to inflection point this year where it starts to really generate cash. So again, mm-hmm. if you strip out the the, the Singapore contract, that, that the underlying cash generation should bring any leverage down quite quickly. Yeah. Another one which is sort of like reached an inflection point is um, Active Ops, which does sort of like um, automation software for the financial uh, services for banks and for insurers. And uh, I think it's more sort of complex sort of case to this. So it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's introduced a new one with sort of, uh, I think it's regulatory, know your customer sort of stuff. And um, it's now just turning EBITDA profitable and it trades on again, 1.5, 1.6 times sales, not, yeah. not very large recurring revenue streams growing at about 10% like for like, or more than 10% like for like. What's your, what's your latest on this one? Because it seems like a bit of a yeah. coiled spring to me. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those which is a, a, um, unfortunately a bit of a, a sort of busted IPO where mm. you know it, it, it floated 
really uh, and with benefit of hindsight the wrong time of the in the market cycle and it was you know, on 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 five time sales and which at the time sort of felt reasonable relative to to, to sort of software multiples um yeah, i think this is a really high quality company and uh, you know the, the great management team really interesting market sort of play into that sort of business process automation uh sort of theme which i think is you know structurally a, a really good place to be and uh, we we for years we were a shareholder in and ET solutions which uh oh, okay. was competitor to active ops and and that got acquired by um uh, by nice the, the sort of yes. really slash american uh tech business for for a decent price and uh, and you know active ops is growing faster it's it's more of a pure SaaS business than than eg was um and, and it's got a great list of blue chip clients so you know it, it's been derated um they they've they've de-emphasized growth in favor of, of getting to profitability quicker and the thing the interesting thing about these SaaS businesses and why they're rated highly typically is because you know they might not be profitable um on a, on a sort of headline basis but you know, that's because they're investing to grow if they stop trying to grow as fast and trying to acquire new customers, the recurring revenue base means that they can sort of, once they've got to a certain scale, they can be quite profitable. So you know, it's it, it, a real proof point for, for ActiveOx. I think it'll be hitting EBITDA profitability, doing exactly what they said they're going to do when they sort of you know, decided to decided to slow down. Um, but yeah, you know, one again, one point six times sales. It, it's for me that's just the wrong price. Yeah, no, and I think they were profitable, weren't they, before they IPO'd back in sort of yeah, 2019. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, only because, it's only because they're basically growing is that they're, uh, they went, uh, they went uh, loss-making. Now, another one which um, I picked up, actually, from um, the ABBA Voyage virtual lab uh, watching <laughs> okay. is, Ox- is Oxford Metrics, which yeah. does this specialist technology that digitizes mm-hmm. human movement into, um, into data. Into mo- and, and they come yeah. out with phenomenal sort of like products, which is, you know, just go and watch uh, Avatar or go and watch, say, mm-hmm. Abba Voyage or anything like that. But also, for, oh, I guess yeah. it's for military as well as entertainment and medics, medicine as well. Yeah. It was like, the other thing, the, the other thing to comment on, which I'll be, which will be, is they've got an enormous mountain of cash. What are yeah. they going to do with it as well? Yeah, good, good question. So, the, the, the Ultimetrics is a company we had back for quite a few years, and we and we sold it, you know, probably eighteen months, twenty four months ago, um, you know, on, on grounds of valuation. Um, at that point, it had. Two businesses. It had the the the, the Yotta. The, 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 the business you just described. It also had Yotta, which was a business mm. that was selling sort of asset management software into in, in services into local government. The, the two, you know, they probably didn't really naturally fit together. Um, and and so they sold the uh, the Yotta business last year, and that's why they got the the, the big mountain of cash as you put it. Um, <laughs> and you know. And, 67 million pounds compared yeah, to a market yeah. cap of about 136 yeah and, and and i think if you if you disaggregate those two things and look at yes. what uh what, what the, the vicon business could or should be worth because i mean this is a, a lead a world leading business with mm. with you know genuine strong ip which you know patent protected ip in this area with multiple applications, you know, not, it's not just the entertainment industry, as you pointed out, it's the, you know, the applications in in defence, in life sciences, um, which they probably haven't exploited as much as they as they could or, or hopefully will do. And I think you know, you've got the opportunity here for a business to return a decent amount of cash to shareholders, which they've, they've a track record of having done in, historically when they've when they've closed or or, or, or divested the businesses, um, and then still re- sort of retaining enough enough cash to really invest in the Vicon proposition. So I think, you know, it's, it's, it's a genuine, you know, it doesn't, people, people sort of complain we don't have enough genuine world leading sort of mm. software and IP businesses. Well, here is one. So you know, let, let's, let's back them to grow. Yeah. And I think just, I mean, if you back out the cash, I think their price earnings multiples probably falls to about 15 times, which is for a growth business like this is, uh, Looks absolutely fabulous. Um, now, one for um, the cost of living crisis beneficiary is all things Telecom Plus, which does the utility warehouse and stuff. Now, yeah. I know if you want to aggregate your your gas, electricity bills, your, your broadband, you can save about 135p, 335 yeah. pounds a year or something. That's, that's what they're advertising anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's sort of, sort of special place in my heart, this stock, because I, when I was a, a sell side analyst a, a good few years ago, I, it was one of the first stocks I, oh, okay. I started covering when I was one, one of the places I worked. And you know, back then, it was I think it was 80p a share, so it's done quite well since then. Um, but the... Um, yeah, brilliantly. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, 
it, it's a really well positioned business, and I think it's it, it, what well, it's flipped from during last year. Um, it's flipped from being a steady eddy, you know, nice recurring revenue business generating cash and paying an attractive dividend yield to you know suddenly sort of re- re- resuming its sort of position as a as a growth stock because mm. you know, the, the the energy crisis has. Uh, you know, really given them a competitive advantage because they've got this multi-utility proposition. You know, they're they're they and and they've also got this uh, sort of partner selling model. Their 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 cost mm. of customer acquisition and their and their cost of good. You know, their overheads relative to the to, to the, the revenue they've got gives them more pricing power and 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 you know. So in an environment where you've got hugely rising energy costs, you've got. Now, they can be really competitive, and so they've been they've, they've sort of resumed winning customers quite quite strongly. Um, and you know, I, I see no reason why that can't continue for for, for the foreseeable future. So this suddenly goes from you know, being pretty steady to, to to being really quite exciting. Yeah, yeah, no, and it's got a good strong balance sheet. And uh, as you say, if you go from ATP mm-hmm. to uh, over twenty pounds in that yeah, period, but to be too fair, that's over fifteen years. It's not, okay, it's well, it's still not bad. <laughs> twenty times. If I, could, if I could do that a few times, I'd be re- re- reasonably yeah. happy. <laughs> Another one which is sort of like um, doing a doing a tr- transformation, I guess, is is EKF Diagnostics, which was a big beneficiary mm-hmm. of COVID. I think yeah. with it, with it, sort of the testing trays and stuff like that, and yeah. and, and that's obviously gone away. But they seem to be sort of like you know consolidating on sort of life sciences and lab testing mm-hmm. and all this sort of stuff. And yeah. they, I think I think Gresham's been buying quite a few shares just recently. So there's obviously something there that you're really quite um, sort yeah. of encouraged by. It's a business we've known and and and, and followed for for quite some time, and we've always liked the, the sort of underlying business model and the, and the, the, the technology mm-hmm. and the proposition. The the um, you know the. But financially speaking, this is a you know, it's a high quality fund. You know, it's got high profit yeah. margins. It's growing attractively. Uh, it's got net cash on the balance sheet, and um, you know, we noticed last year that the shares fell from eighty p to thirty percent. It was less. Yes, that's right. Yeah, um, and that was on the back of of uh, you know the COVID related sort of profits that they had, which were you know, was, they weren't sort of trying to pretend they were they were they were super normal profits for during that during that period. Um, would you know that's one of the reasons they've got this mm. very strong net cash balance sheet because of the profits they, they they got from test and trace stuff. Um, you know, but I guess the stock market gets carried away from a sort of short term perspective and thinks that's going to carry on forever and it doesn't. So the shares got derated sort of significantly, which just looked like a great opportunity for us to, as an entry point to what is a high quality company. Mm. Um, and you know, there's particularly the life sciences bit that you mentioned, I think is a you know, really, really exciting growth opportunity for them. Yeah, no, it does look absolutely. I mean, they've delivered, haven't they, for years? So uh, good management team as well. Yeah, um, now, another one which came out with the training update just recently is Cooth, which is the um, sort of like mental health sort of like I think it's a sort of software telemedicine type yeah. business yeah. Um, that has a big position in the in the UK and is now sort of branching out into the US. I think it's got a contract. Was it Pennsylvania or state or something like yeah. that? Do you want to take us through the latest on this one because um, it's got a really good reputation, but again, trading at pretty lackluster valuations. Yeah, I mean. It- it's, this IPO didn't sort of, uh, when was it? It was sort of back in the tw- no, second half of 2020, I think. So yeah. one of the first IPOs post, post-COVID post in the UK. Um, yeah, that was at 200p. They raised yeah. seven, 16 million pounds in September 2020. Yeah, no, it, it's. I, I think it's, this is a great, great high-quality company. It's, it, mm. it's, you know, it's providing a platform, both software and, and kind of digital interaction, plus you know, access to... Real physical uh, uh, trained counsellors to provide mental health services to mm. the children and young people, in, uh, predominantly in, in the UK, um, and and that's an area. One, it's a, it's a huge social benefit. It's trying to to give people mm. access to resources and, and uh, on an anonymous basis uh, in a digital format, which obviously like children and young people these days they're glued to their phones, and that's kind of the, that's a primary me- means of contact. And I think it's it's it, it's it, it's helping the NHS to try and get mm. access to these situations early so that they're preventing some more acute situation mm. further down the line. So it's good from a clinical perspective. It's good from an NHS cost perspective. Um, and it's a, a digital mental health services are 
one of the you know highlighted the strategy papers from the NHS as one of their key priorities to invest in. So it's in an area which we should see increasing investment rather than decreasing investment, even notwithstanding the the struggles the NHS is going through at the moment. So I think the proposition is you know socially good and and it's and financially it's a, it's attractive. Um, you know they've got additional growth opportunities in the US as you highlighted. Um, and, and into adult mental health in the UK, and also corporate wellness as well. So the same sort of platform yeah. is applicable there. So I think it's a really good good business. It's been growing nicely. I think it, it you know, gr- growth uh, stalled a little bit compared to what they'd expected because of the reorganisation of, of the CCGs in, in the NHS and so the structural change in the NHS sort of meant that the kind of their their natural buyers kind of weren't quite sure where the budgets were coming from. That 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 stalled them. So I think that that plus the sell off in tech. And it you know, has, has yeah. resulted in the share price going down, but they had a good good update this morning. Um, you know, I think this is a really well positioned business. And again, so, you know, yes, another business the market seems to be sort of overlooking, uh, despite the growth prospects that they've got, which is which are really very significant. Yeah, I mean, as a, and again, as just for viewers, as a data point, my wife works at a local school, and uh, they use uh, Cooth software mm-hmm. for the mental health. And they can't speak more highly about it. They think it's absolutely great. So um, clearly the product is hitting the right tune in the education sector, yeah. that's for sure. Now, in, in another one which is taking um, sort of like helping the NHS off, taking it sort of like some of the resource off their shoulders, given the elective procedures, we've got a mountain of them, about sort of 7 million of them, is uh, is Medica, which does basically um, all things uh, sort of tele radiology i think it's sort yeah. of digitized images from mris and ct scans mm-hmm. and stuff like that and helps the nhs get a fast turnaround can you give us the latest view on this one because again they're sort of like uh they're trading at about 15 16 times pe and um growing well i think yeah so man, we're, we're we're very bullish on medica it's, it's a specific we are we are just for disclosure we're the largest question we're the largest child in the oh, okay um and you know, we've been been buying shares in, in, in the recent past. Um, you know, it, it's an area, as you as you rightly say, it's an area where the structural growth drivers. So it provides access to trained radiologists to interpret images and scan CT scans and, and such like MRIs, um, and it's providing that capacity on an outsourced basis to the NHS. That there are you know, there is a significant shortage of trained radiologists, mm. um, and it takes a long time to train them. <laughs> So, yes. um, and uh, but there's an increasing demand for for image interpretation, both in, in the clinical setting, but also in in uh, sort of drug discovery and clinical trials area as well, where where imaging is increasingly important to things like Alzheimer's sort of mm. and and, uh, and dementia uh, the drug sort of testing. So, there's there's structural sort of under supply. They've got access to supply. They've also got technology to kind of make that process really efficient. Um, and, and so they're, they're supplying the NHS. They're also uh, the leading player in Ireland now, which they got into through an acquisition. And they they bought a business in the US in uh, about eighteen months. Oh, that's ago, right. Yeah, which is which is sort of accessing that clinical trial, sort of pharmaceutical biotech market, which is also growing really, really strongly. So business has been growing double digit top line. Um, it's a market leader in the UK, uh, and you know, we think very high quality management team, clear strategy. But but it's one of those stocks where you know I played a few years ago with with fantastically sort of ambitious growth targets, mm. even though it grew uh, to all intensive you know, to, to 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 all observers would, would if you didn't know the context would say this has been a fantastic growth story. It just didn't quite grow as fast as as they had originally sort of anticipated. That resulted in the shares falling and the management getting changed. Um, but you know, n- now they're rebuilding that, and we think you know, this has got a great long-term opportunity. And if you look at the valuation, I mean, you, you highlight the PE multiple, but mm. the, you know, the transactions in this space typically will be done on EV but DAR basis. That's that's the the, yeah. the, 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 the multiple the, the metric that that corporate or private equity buyers would look at. This is trading on nine times uh, yeah. currently, and um, you know, transaction multiples in this space. You know, a, a close competitor. Was bought relatively recently by private equity um, for for closer to fifteen times. So you know there's a big gap there. And going back to the sort of conversation at the start of this this this, this mm, uh, interview, this interview, it, it's um, you know there's a big gap there. And if if the stock market doesn't start to, to re-rate the business to reflect the, the growth profile, then uh, I wouldn't surprise me if someone comes along and tries to do that for them. Mm. 
Well, you did say you didn't want um, your stocks to be all yeah. at the same time, but I think there's a strong chance. <laughs> well, no, it, it depends. Uh, if, they, if, they, if they play the, if they pay tomorrow's price today and, and it's, yeah. uh, it's, a, it's a great price, then then, then fine. But just you know, we, we wait. And when we're the bigger shareholder, if, if someone comes along and it's a price that we're not happy with, then we'll say no and it probably won't happen. Yeah, gotcha. Now, another one which is the highest quality. I mean, you, that seems a sort of good feature. You've got undervalued, but highest quality stocks with recurring revenue streams is BioVentix, which basically yeah. does sort of antibodies for uh, blood testing, I think. And I think, and uh, just for investors, I think a sort of like an antibody helps um, sort of like highlight whether you've got a, a you know, virus or some sort of condition in your mm-hmm. body because it sort of acts as a biomarker. Could you take us to this one? Because again, it's, it's just sort of like continually sort of hitting the, you know, hitting huge profit margins. Sort of, in yeah. fact, I was looking at it, EBITDA margins are roughly around about 80%, I think it is. Yeah, really this, is this is one of those times when I, when I first saw this company, I and mean, it's quite a few years ago now, when it moved, it moved from what was then plus markets to AIM, mm. which is when we first invested in it. And it's it's one of those businesses where you sort of look at it and you blink and you kind of think, Am I, is this, this really right? 80% margin. This is it. <laughs> and, and, you know, it is a phenomenal business and it's been a brilliant investment for us. But um, you know, the business model, it's a, essentially it's a research and development company yeah. that, uh, that, that licenses its intellectual property once it's, it's been developed. Uh, um, uh, to pharmaceutical companies and laboratories that are, that are doing testing with, uh, with antibodies, as you pointed out, um, and it, and it gets royalty streams from that. There's, a, there's there's you know there's a small number of people in the company, scientists, just tr- tr- trying to find the next thing. Mm. And the next thing probably won't turn into revenues for for you know three, four, five years. But the things they've already invented in the past are generating really attractive royalties with sort of limited cost of goods sold. So uh, hence the the high margin. It's it's hugely cash generative. And we, since we first invested, we've had you know, more than our original investment investment back in dividends because the company pays wow. a dividend yield plus special dividends every now and again when they build up too much cash. Mm. And, and we've had a, you know, a a very significant multiple of our original cost in, in, in terms of capital appreciation as well. So it's been a phenomenal story. You know, great, great company, just a quirky little sort of niche where yeah. the business model just stands out and, and, and you know, fit, ticks all of our boxes really. No, I mean the IPR is absolutely. Um, I mean, it just just shows you, doesn't it? If it's got eighty percent profit margins, it's got strong USPs there. That's yeah. for sure. Now, a couple just moving to sort of two final ones: industrials and engineering. Um, yeah. Sort of franchise brands, which has again sort of transformed. Mm-hmm. I think last year when it bought the filter business, which is did sort of like uh, sort of I think it helps um, uh, sort of like stadium and uh, yeah. do, doing their their. Their, their fat fire sort of management and stuff like that, but yeah. they, they've bolted that onto sort of like their metro rod as well. Mm-hmm. Can you take us through this one? Because it, 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 it seems to have really jump started their sort of like you know their growth and um, the resilience of the mm-hmm. business. Yeah, well, we, we we invested in franchise brands at, at, at the IPO. Um, mm-hmm. It's backing Stephen Hemsley, who's the exec chair. Um, yeah, who he, he he was the CEO and then literally the chairman of Domino's. So he, he sort of understands franchising as a as a as a concept. And originally they were Sort of acquiring franchise um, sort of networks in in B B two C. So yes, you know, you've got things like uh, oven clean, where someone will come around and uh, be self employed and come around and clean your oven, um, and not just wipe it down, like properly clean it, and yeah. and uh, chips away that that sort of come and mend the, the sort of small scratch on your car and such like. But then they bought Metro Rod, um, which was you know not very well run prior to them sort of buying it. Uh, to B to B, effectively equivalent of Dyna Rod, but in the B to B market, um, and you know, they 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 did a lot of work to try and turn that round and, and improve the systems and processes and sort of in, enhance the franchisee proposition, um, and and they've done a great job of that, and it, and, and, and it was very resilient through COVID, um, and you know, the reason why I like franchise businesses as in the net franchise network is because mm. they're really low capital employed, high return on capital, very profitable cash generative business because you know, ultimately they're getting a royalty stream of some, of some form from the franchisee who is taking, you know, who, who ultimately is taking the risk and has got, has got the, 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 the costs of operating and um, they support them. Um, so as long as your franchisees are making money and happy, then then the franchise system as a whole can, can be really successful. They, they did the acquisition of Filter, which we, we were also a major shareholder in Filter so it was a, it was a, a merger, mm-hmm. sort of all share merger, and filter 
I mean, it's a fantastic business. It's, it's, it's mm. largely in the US, although it does have a UK presence. And it's, as you say, it's sort of doing the slightly unglamorous work of sending guys in, in vans with a specialist piece of equipment to suck the oil out of a deep fat fryer at 300 mm. degrees Celsius and, and then filter it through a miniaturized oil filtration unit. Um, and, you know, it, it sounds very unglamorous, but it's a recurring revenue model. They go to, go to a, you know, conference centers or a stadium or, or, or hospitality. And, and by, by providing the service, they elongate the, 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 the life of the oil, which saves, which it saves them money. It makes it cleaner, which makes the food quality better. It avoids sort of untrained people chucking the oil down the sink or something or down the drain and, and causing an environmental pollution, which ultimately might um, result in fines. Uh, and it also, from a health and safety perspective, it means a trained professional is doing it rather than sort of casual workforce in a, in a hospitality environment. Which so it's got it's got great great sort of credentials to it, and it's on this franchise high high recurring revenue, um, you know, visible cash generative, bit, and, and there's other things they can sell on top. So the combination is really good, and you've got the CEO of the of a filter. It's based in the US. Uh, he can now focus just on running the US business, and, yeah. and Stephen and the team and franchise brands in the UK can 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 run the group in the UK operation. So, yeah, you know, I, I think this is is high quality team, great business model, and you know, good opportunity. Yeah, once he's done a great um, or a couple of good acquisitions, then uh, it gives them gives them a bit more. Uh, well, they've got the blueprint, haven't they, to buy you know what yeah. they're looking for and to, to bolt it on and just add that extra revenue now the, the last one is uh is flowtech fluid power which has got yeah. really sort of like a, a stable of fantastic value gap investors and it's yourselves yeah. and i think uh i think downing are in there harwood are in there and you know it's a list as long as you're on like the chairman's uh roger mcdowell and stuff yeah. like that and they do they're a big they're a distributor of sort of like specialist uh, pneumatic and hydraulic parts mm-hmm. to yeah. businesses i think you t- take us through this one because again they're relatively cheap, ten times PE, and um, the shares have been pretty static actually over the last sort of like you know, two or three years. Yeah, I think I think there's the reason the shares have not really moved is because there's a sort of perception that uh, the, the the end customers of the, of the business are sort of cyclically exposed because they're sort of industrial mm. yeah, right okay. businesses. Um, but I think you know this is a distributor, so. You know, distributors do well; they should do well in times of inflation because they because mm. they kind of uh, increase the prices. They're, they're effectively as long as they've got got um, you know, efficient processes to turn stock, and you know they don't get stuck with 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 things. Then you know they, they should be able to sort of just pass pass through the costs. Um, so you know I think the business model is is quite well set for this current environment. The management team is strong. They kind of really understand their sector. As you say, you've got Roger McDowell on on, on the board, who's who's a seasoned operator and, and kind of will keep them all honest. And yeah. um, you know the the the, the, what they actually do, and this is why it's interesting, is is you know these are quite low value but extremely high high importance mm. sort of components into into the end customer. So you know the pricing power they've got is is, is really you know quite high um, because you, know, you you can't a, a large piece of kit can't fail because a, a sort of mm. you know, a, a, a very low value item isn't working. So, so, so they're, they're in demand and they're able, you know, they can basically sort of name their price in certain situations. So I think it's well positioned in a niche market. Um, I, I think that the sick cavity perception is, is sort of outweighed by that kind of critical component. Yeah. The mission critical yeah. nature. Yeah. Mission critical, exactly. Um, and so, you know, I think it's well positioned. That if, the, if the stock market doesn't rate it, then you know this this could easily form part of a you know a bigger distribution business that's got sort of multiple facets to it. Yeah, and I think it, it seems an incredibly um, sort of like low hanging fruit for a big private equity house wanting to do a buy and build for this one. But uh, but who knows? It could be. <laughs> There's plenty of those in your portfolio. Um, anyway, yeah. um, thanks very much, um, Ken, for your time. Brilliant um, summary of all those um, investment ideas that people have a look through. And if people want to invest in uh, your funds in, um, in Gresham House, how best to go about doing it? Uh, well, we've just, just so many ways. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. no, we, 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 we've got three open-ended funds, which uh, you know, a micro-cap fund, smaller companies fund, and multi-cap income fund. And those, those are uh, typically on on all of the normal platforms that people will, 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 will be signed up to, um, you know, AJ Bell, Hargreaves, Lansdowne, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and then we've also got strategic equity capital, which is the, the investment trust that we have, which again is, you know, is accessible through the platforms. And that one is, you know, that's just taking a very concentrated approach 
Uh, you know, 80% of the value of the fund is in 10 holdings. And you, know, you mentioned Medica, that's one of the largest holdings in that fund. Um, and, you know, so we, we that, that's kind of, I guess, a shot window for our approach. And what, what we do is um, you know, trying to find strategically value businesses, the strategic value in businesses that are underappreciated by the market, where we can try and help them to, to, to kind of get the market to see that, that, that it should be re-rated. Yeah, well, I, I must—I rarely interview fund managers with uh, all fifteen stock ideas that uh, look significantly <laughs> undervalued compared to private markets. Yeah. But uh, I get that. I guess as a reflection well, of the selection, and you, you selected them rather than me. So, so. Oh, so it's, 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 a, it's a it's a it's a sort of like a reflection, I think, of the uh, of the stock picking prowess of the team, but also sort of like uh, the valuations have come down so much, isn't it, over the last twelve months, and gives the opportunity. So, yeah. All right. Well, thanks very much, Ken. Okay. Well, thanks for having me. Great to chat. Bye. Okay. Cheers.